Hi everyone. So today we're here to talk about networking, um, navigating network topologies in CFCR. So before we get started, we just want to give like a little bit of a prequel of like why we're even here or how we came up with this talk. So um, basically, we work with Kubernetes and CFCR a lot, and the thing that we wanted to dig into and understand for ourselves was really what are the like layers of networking that exists in Kubernetes and also in Bosch so that we could understand it better for ourselves. So for those that are experts in Kubernetes, hopefully this will give you, like you might get a little bit of information out of this, but for those that are brand new to it or coming from the Cloud Foundry world, then hopefully you'll find this useful, um, at least for being able to help debug stuff that you all are working with with Kubernetes, maybe. So let's get started. So I'm Neil. I'm a software engineer working at Pivotal. I work on the Pivotal Container Service team in Dublin. Hi, everyone. I'm Ravashi. I am also an engineer at Pivotal, and I'm based out of the San Francisco office working on the Cloud Foundry Container Runtime team. Cool. So today, we're going to do a quick recap of what exactly Cloud Foundry's Container Runtime, or CFCR, is. Um, if we say CFCR through the t throughout the talk, that's what we're talking about. Um, and then once we've gotten that little bit of background, we're going to go into the main purpose of the talk, which is basically what are the layers of networking that are made up in CFCR, um, both in terms of Bosch and also Kubernetes. And we'll go in a bit more of a deep dive into those. And then we'll kind of finish up with what exactly are like the things that are being worked on at the moment in both the Cloud Foundry and also the Kubernetes communities in terms of uh, networking. So let's kick us off. Um, we're going to talk a bit about what exactly CFCR is. Cool. So Cloud Foundry Container Runtime, what is it? It's a Bosch deployed Kubernetes cluster. So what our team works on is packaging up a lot of the Kubernetes dependencies and things that basically you need to be able to create a reproducible cluster. We provide it into a Bosch release, so any Bosch operator can go onto the platform, deploy it, and get a KH cluster. Um, we try to strive to make it configurable through your standard mechanisms for a Bosch release. So via job spec properties, you can configure system components. You can, um, if you have a lot of Kubernetes knowledge and want to configure your API server in a particular way, we kind of expose a lot of those properties to allow you to do so. Uh, I think the biggest thing that we're kind of like paying attention to is continuing to keep the Kubernetes experience, whether you're on Bosch or off of it, a multi-cloud experience, because most people don't want to be locked down to a particular IaaS. Bosch, as we know, is multi-cloud, so is Kubernetes. So it just makes sense for CFCR to also be in that fashion. And the other thing that we kind of like more or less are adhering to is keeping aligned with GKE and being compatible with what features it's actually deploying inside of the clusters that you can get. So GKE is that Google Kubernetes engine. It has a hosted and also on-prem solution. Um, so what we do is actually take a look at how they're configuring their features whenever a minor release of Kubernetes is available. And we kind of use that as a borrow metric to uh, make sure that we're meeting the needs of the general uh, audience that's looking for a Kubernetes cluster wherever they're deploying it, but especially in Bosch. So that was just a little bit about CFCR, but now let's get into kind of like the meat of this talk. We wanted to just do a kind of overview of the three networking topologies that we're going to be talking about in this talk. And that first one is actually Bosch. So in the past year or so, they came out with an internal DLS uh, solution that actually helps you to resolve um, different VMs inside of your deployment. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we leverage that inside of CFCR for particular features. We're also going to talk about overlay networks. And just to kind of give you an overview of what that is and, and level set on overlay network, it's very simply a network on top of another network. Um, what it really strives to achieve with routing traffic uh, between different IPs and things like that is by doing this method of encapsulation on data packets. So we're going to talk a little bit specifically about how this is achieved via flannel um, a little bit more in depth. And just some common like examples of when you're thinking of standard overlay networks, just to kind of 
see been in through examples is like something like a VPN. So if you're in your office and you have your physical network set up and someone in your IT department has already set up the network that's going to be allowing you to, um, to have access to your hosts in, in your office and things like that, that would be through a VPN setup. So that's just another network that's on top of another network. And same thing with like CDNs, so content delivery networks in just the internet. So you have internet being your networking layer and then the CDN on top of it is your ability to hit CDN so that you can cache websites and access them a lot faster. Another example of a network on top of a network. Um, and lastly, we're going to talk about Kubernetes services. So uh, services are a grouping of pods with an access policy. Um, it's kind of like an internal load balancing inside of your Kubernetes clusters that you can set up for your pods. Uh, so we're going to actually take a deep dive into that and, and look at how Kube Proxy helps us to achieve uh, Kubernetes services in, in a cluster. All right, let's start with the first layer that was Bosch. So hopefully you're all familiar with Bosch. Um, it has been like the cornerstone of Cloud Foundry for a number of years and is kind of the principle of why the CFCR project started, right? So we're providing Kubernetes on top of Bosch. But what exactly does that mean in terms of networking? Like, is there additional networking on top? And basically, we're just going to cover a little bit about what that is and what's added on top. So let's spin us, let's spin us up a CFCR cluster. So for those familiar with Kubernetes, you'll recognize this instantly. We have three masters and three workers. And they've grabbed IP addresses from the Bosch network range. So you can see here the masters are from 1 through to 3, and the workers are from 4 through to 6. So let's look a little closer at the masters, for example. So I posed this question, right? What happens when one of these virtual machines goes away? It dies, right? One of my masters just disappears for whatever reason. What do we do? Panic. No. <laughs> so this is like what you would like typically think, right? Something has gone away. What, 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 what do I do? So we all know that Bosch, and we know and love Bosch, and we know why it's there. It brings things back when it recognizes that things are gone, right? So Bosch has recognized that the VM is gone, nothing special here, and it brings it back up. But if you notice from this one, um, we're using IP addresses, and it's come back up on this dot .7, right? So for the student among you have, may have noticed that what this means is that nothing can talk to that master anymore because they're expecting it to be on the dot one IP address, and it's come back up on dot seven. So this master is now basically come back up. Bosch brought it back, but it's kind of useless because it can't rejoin. So operators are not very happy, right? Wasted resources. This machine is just sitting there. It's kind of basically useless because it re can't rejoin. So this is, as Ravashi was saying earlier, something that came in about a year ago to the Bosch project was Bosch DNS. And very simply put, it just allows you to be able to assign DNS names to your virtual machines instead of using IP addresses directly. So Bosch uh, is DNS to the rescue. And if you actually look up this, there's actually a number of white papers with this uh, name. So if you're interested, go check those out. DNS solves all the problems. So here we go, like, for example, just create three names, m1.internal, m2, and m3. And now anytime we want to reference those uh, masters, we just use the names instead. And basically, we don't need to worry about IP addresses. And our master will be able to rejoin the cluster as soon as Bosch brings it back up for us. So hopefully there's nothing too new or special about that, and hopefully you recognize and maybe that's all really simple and obvious to you. Um, so we're going to kick off um, the kind of Kubernetes side of things and talk about the overlay network. Great. So um, one thing I kind of want to mention like about overlay network, uh, not specific to CFCR, but just in Kubernetes clusters in general, is that it's actually not required for you to set up an overlay network in any of your Kubernetes clusters. Um, but it does ease your pod-to-pod -pod communication. That's kind of like the main value that it's adding. And anything outside of that is usually some extra fancy stuff that the software-defined networking layer is kind of giving you. 
Um, so if you weren't going to use an overlay network, what you would probably end up doing is using a flat routing network. Um, this is actually the operator or the person who's installing that Kubernetes clusters would have maybe much more of a say um, at their IaaS layer where saying like these nodes that contain these containers or these IPs actually have mappings over to other containers and nodes, uh, sorry, other containers inside of nodes and can talk to one each other. So it requires the operator to do a little bit more um, configuration, whereas if you had something like flannel or an overlay network, that would kind of happen for you and you wouldn't have to do that mapping. And depending on the IaaS that you're using, you could actually hit some limitations on the amount of map map mappings that you can actually configure between those two things. So um, what we use in CFCR is kind of like the simple, um, easy to use setup that's kind of recommended for Kubernetes clusters. It's uh, more or less almost considered sometimes even the default CNI plugin that you could have inside of your cluster. It's, but it's called Flannel. It's uh, run by CoreOS. Like I said, it's a CNI. It's not just specifically for the Kubernetes use case. You could actually use it for various other things that you're deploying. Um, but for us in CFCR, it's kind of the, the easiest way to get going. Um, if you want some of your fancier things that you want to do at your networking layer, such as creating network policies. Flannel is not going to really be able to provide that much in that space, but it's a great way to get started. Um, so we're going to talk about Flannel a little bit more in CFCR. This is just to show you kind of in a CFCR cluster where you have a master and three workers that are running. Um, these are workers that are running the kubelet process inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Where is Flannel? Um, so the biggest thing that we should call out actually first is that Flannel heavily utilizes etcds to understand those mappings, um, where containers are and what IPs they're addressed at. They also store that information in etcd. And as a result, we actually have Flannel running on every host inside of the cluster uh, in a CFCR deployment to, to be able to kind of understand where those mappings are and easily talk to etcd. Um, so focusing in on just like kind of one node, so one worker that's inside of the cluster, uh, in, in Kubernetes, um, we're going to take a look at how pod-to-pod -pod communication is achieved. So explaining this diagram just a little bit is that I have P1 over here on the left, and it's to denote a pod that's a existing inside of this worker. Uh, pods are a group of containers that are in the same ne network uh, namespace, effectively. So you could have one pod that's actually comprises of multiple containers. But that pod itself is assigned a unique IP. Um, and it's actually Kubernetes delegating over to Docker and CFCR to create a uh, virtual bridge that has a CIDR range uh, that will say, like, this container will be created inside of that CIDR range, um, and a virtual Ethernet device that actually maps to F0 so that um, it is possible for containers that are inside of that node via Docker to be able to communicate with one another. So that's kind of just like standard, not really specific to Kubernetes per se, but Docker in particular, about how containers are able to talk to each other um, when they're all within that same um, node and Docker, Docker's virtual bridge is kind of handling the communication between those two containers. Uh, but if you're trying to do pod-to-pod -pod communication uh, across ver nodes in the cluster, so um, how does Flannel help you with that? So I have the same image, but I have now have two nodes, two workers inside of that cluster. So P1 on the left and P2 on the right. And they've been, those pods have been allocated their own unique IPs by the, the Docker processes that are running inside of that node. Um, so you know it falls into the Docker zero uh, bridge range. And so you can imagine that we have data that's coming out of P1, and it wants to talk to P2. So how is Flannel achieving this? Um, what happens is that in CFCR and in most uh, cases of Kubernetes, we have a CNI bridge that gets configured by Flannel. Um, we call it in CFCR CNI zero, and that's going to be for Flannel basically to set up some rules and basically dictate that data that's flowing inside of this wider uh, rule, this range, is actually going to go through the Flannel bridge instead of the typical Docker bridge. So that's kind of communicating that this traffic is actually going outside of this node, not necessarily within the node where uh, Docker is running. Um, and what Flannel actually does is attach a UDP header on top of that data packet, which now dictates its new source and destination IPs. The way that Flannel knows how to do that is, once again, by actually talking to etcd, because that's where it stores information about, oh, hey, I know this, this pod is registered at this IP and lives at this node's IP. So it attaches that UDP header which then allows it to actually uh, communicate over to the other node and uh, fall into its respective CNI bridge, in this case, Flannel. Um, and it actually chops off that UDP header and says, OK, now route traffic normally, and you know that this, um, 
route traffic to this IP normally and find 10.200, 2.1. So that's how it makes it over from P1 to P2. Um, so that was kind of like pods and containers and how communication is offered between those two. But now let's look at how Kubernetes does services and kind of does that internal load balancing thing that we were talking about earlier. So in the services network, um, let's go back to pods again, right? So pods are ephemeral in the Kubernetes world. They can go away, they can disappear at any time, and their IP addresses can change at any given instant in time. So just like Bosch, we can't rely on IP addresses at all. So how do we do this then, right? So if the IP addresses change all the time, what, what do we do? And this is where the services network comes in. So the first thing to know about it is that it doesn't really exist. Um, it's totally virtual, which means that whatever IP addresses that the service network is going to give to you, it doesn't map to anything physically in the infrastructure or any device. There are IP addresses that are stable, and they will give you the IP address of the pod eventually, but um, they don't actually map to anything physically in the infrastructure. So how does it do this, right? So that's what this, this part of the talk is all about. Um, so the services network provides like a couple of things for us in the Kubernetes world. First of all, it provides us like the internal routing, essentially. How I get from my pod A to my pod B, the squiggly line up here on the diagram. So Ravashi was talking about like inter-node communication, but we're just talking about pods that all live on the same node, on the same machine. How do they talk to each other if they can't use IP addresses? So it provides us, first of all, with the internal, but it also provides us with a way to access those pods from somewhere outside the cluster. So it allows us to go, for example, from the public internet, if we so expose it, to hitting one of these pods that's running in our cluster. And we don't really need to care about IP addresses or anything. It just it does it all for us. Um, in the Kubernetes world, um, there are a couple of constructs for this. The main one that most people use um, on the public IaaS is, is just type load balancer. And what that will do is Kubernetes will just go provision you a load balancer in your IaaS of choice. And then we'll, you can just use that, and you'll be able to access your workloads from the external public network. Um, it also provides you with other ways that you can do it so you don't do it public facing, but um, that is the main way. So let's have an example, right? Let's see like, something more concrete of what a service actually is. So let's kick off uh, with a deployment. So we're going to create this deployment. Um, it has three databases, so three pods running. These are the databases storing our persistent information that we want for our application that we're just going to create. And let's create basically how we access it, so how we can access these pods. So let's create our service. Um, and what this will do is Kubernetes will give us something known as a cluster IP. And I was saying earlier that we need some kind of stable way of being able to access these workloads. And this is what Kubernetes provides for us out of the box. So it will give us an IP address. And when we hit that IP address, it will route the traffic from there to one of these uh, pods that's running somewhere on our machine. So let's spin up a front end for this application that we're creating. And it needs to be able to talk to the database for whatever reason, be able to get some data, just like any other application. So what does it do, right? It's not going to hit the pod's IPs directly, because that doesn't really make sense. We said they're ephemeral. So it's going to hit this cluster IP instead. So it's going to send this request to the cluster IP. And this is basically where the load balancing of Kubernetes comes into play. And it will uh, basically route the traffic from this IP address to one of these pods. Um, in Kubernetes, um, in one of the particular modes, uh, this is random distribution of choice. So you will, once you hit that IP, your packet will go to one of these three nodes randomly, basically, 33% chance of hitting one of these. So how does it do it? This IP doesn't exist. How does it, how does it actually do this, then? So there's something running on each of the workers in Kubernetes known as kubeproxy. Um, you might have possibly seen this and be like, hey, what is that thing doing? So hopefully you'll have some idea after me explaining what's going on. So it's responsible basically for this implementation of like how I go from this IP address that's virtual, doesn't really exist, to one that actually does exist, one of these pod IPs. And how it does that is when you have your service created, 
it installs something called IP table rules onto the machines. And basically, those rules are the things that determine where the packet goes from this IP address that doesn't exist to one that actually does really exist. So we're going to dig a bit into exactly how this works. Uh, but before we do, there are three modes that you can configure your kube proxy in in Kubernetes today. These are kind of chronologically from left to right in terms of when they came out. So in the early days of Kubernetes, user space was the main and only routing mode available for your kube proxy. Along came IP tables and just went GA is IPVS. So in CFCR, we are using IP tables at the moment. So let's deep dive a little bit and see like how this kind of virtual IP going to a real IP works. So before we get into it, though, we need to take one little detour and just uh, kind of define a couple of things in this world. Because Kubernetes currently lives in this world, really. It's not very Windows friendly at the moment. Uh, so let's talk about Linux. So there are two main concepts. They're pretty simple that we just need to understand before you go further. Um, user space and kernel space. User space is basically where all your normal processes run. They kind of can only access a restricted amount of resources. They can only um, do certain things, and they have limited amount of functionality. And then we have kernel space, which basically has full access to everything in the hardware and also the system resources. So it has all the power. So those that may have noticed, the first, ro first routing mode was called user space, and that actually ran in user space. Confusingly, they're the same name. Um, but IP tables runs in kernel space. So how does it do this? So in Linux, there's a module called NetFilter. And NetFilter basically provides this way of being able to go how to like, when, it come, when a packet comes in, it does like an in, internal like way of routing from one thing to another. So it does this like translation of virtual IP to real IP. So as I said, it runs in uh, kernel space, so it has all the power, so it's pretty fast. It's one of the reasons why they moved away from user space. And what it does is basically it just matches packets that come in to the machine. Um, if they match a certain amount of rules, then basically it will redirect the packet to wherever it needs to go to. So if we see here on the right, um, this diagram basically kind of sums it up. So the first thing when my packet comes into my networking interface, it goes through a filtering process. And then a decision has to happen. And that decision happens in another module in Linux, of course, uh, which is known as contract. And contract is basically um, a way of being able to connect or to uh, have connection tracking in Linux. And basically, if something has been seen coming from an IP address going to another one already, it just skips over everything. It takes the true path and just like, gives it back the IP address that it already knows about to route it to. Otherwise, it does this mapping of virtual IP to real IP. And then the next time that packet comes in, it will just skip over that and just go through the true statement and just continue on. So let's take a look at back to our example of our app with our databases. And what does the contract entry look like for this? So here's the contract entry on the first time the packet comes into us. So you can see that the source IP is coming from our application on the right, and its destination is for the cluster IP. And what happens after it has gone through that process on the previous slide is it actually translates, and this is what you really get. So your app one is the source, and your destination is actually to one of these databases. As I said, random distribution, so I just chose one. So that was an overview kind of of the services in there layer. There's lots more in it. Um, but basically, we're just going to round out this talk by giving an update on what's going on in the networking community of Kubernetes today. Yeah, so um, if you've been in the Kubernetes community before, chances are that you've come across these things called SIGs. They're special interest groups. And um, networking is no different. It has its own SIG. And this is a group that meets pretty regularly to talk about uh, networking initiatives inside of Kubernetes and how they can grow that and mature that. 
So one of the things that we uh, kind of noticed in Zoo within the past year that was like one of their bigger changes was actually replace their internal DNS, cube DNS, with core DNS um, instead of Kubernetes clusters. So that's um, kind of like a configurable option in CFCR right now, whether you want to use core DNS or stick with uh, cube DNS. But in newer versions of Kubernetes, and actually I think the next coming version, they're going to actually default it to core DNS. Um, and it just is, I think it's just basically a rewrite of KubeDNS and offers a lot better performance. And another cool thing that they're working on is um, external DNS. So as a Kubernetes user, if you want to set up external DNS for anything or any types of services in your cluster, you can use a new custom resource called external DNS. And that's currently in alpha. They're working with different providers to mature that experience. But if you're a cluster user and say you want to use like AWS Route 53, um, you could use this resource to configure those uh, DNS entries, which is pretty useful. Uh, they've also been working on, in the next upcoming releases, multiple pods having, or pods having multiple IP addresses. So that's a feature that a lot of people have been asking for, especially when it comes to IPv6, where it can be uh, useful to have multiple IP addresses registered to a pod. Um, and another thing we wanted to highlight was that support for our IBVS and QProxy actually went GA in the last release of 1.11. Um, so we had talked about a little bit how that was kind of the, the most recent stage for QProxy to use, and it's kind of the, the fancier new thing. As for kind of Bosch DNS and where it's at right now, we currently leverage it to do DNS resolution for Bosch instance groups. But actually in flight for the Bosch team is that they're working on doing DNS resolution for jobs as well. So this uh, gives us a better, more fine gain control over putting in more DNS entries. And we definitely want to use that inside of CFCR. Um, as for our release, uh, I kind of mentioned that Flannel is our default uh, CNI that we have inside of the release. We, in the future, actually want to provide the ability to have more of these CNIs be pluggable inside of that release and give people a lot more flexibility, especially if they want to do some fancy stuff like network policies and things like that. We've definitely seen a big trend in um, networking interest inside of the Kubernetes experience. So it would make sense for, I think, CFCR to go down that path when we um, are ready to introduce that functionality. So in summary, I hope you uh, took away kind of the three networking topologies and got to learn more about how Bosch works, how the overlay network works in CFCR, as well as Kubernetes services, a little bit of a deep dive in each of these. Um, and maybe you came away with the idea that maybe it's a little bit complex at first, but maybe just giving you a high level overview that you'll see that it's a lot of technologies coming together, making a really great experience, and it actually does work out pretty well. So uh, thank you so much for coming to our talk. If you want to talk to us about networking or really anything CFCR related, we have the CFCR channel in the Cloud Foundry open source Slack. You could shoot us an email. We definitely want to hear about different networking use cases that you're using, uh, any different CNIs that you're particularly itching to use in CFCR. And if for any reason you want to talk to Neil and I, here's our, our Slack handle um, in the Cloud Foundry um, community space as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming to our talk. If you have any questions, we'll be up here. Feel free to come up to us. I think we're just a little bit short on time, so we'll probably do questions like in person. But thank you.